I feel a little jet lagged. I, I actually did get to spend uh, a, an evening at home the other night. It was pretty exciting. But then I drove yesterday back down to New York City last night. My brother and six, sister turned 65 yesterday. So uh, came down for dinner with them. And uh, so what are we going to do today? Let's I have to read it here. I'm going to talk about qualities of light, okay? The kind of light that I'm looking for uh, when I'm going out to shoot. And then I'm going to talk a little bit about composition. And then we're going to look in my bag and I'll talk about, I keep it really simple. And uh, then after that, we're going to, I'm going to show you pictures in the book and I'm going to tell you kind of, you know, how I took them. I mean, it, it's all, my approach is very simple. And then I'm going to deliver at the same time a little bit of a message about conservation while I'm doing that. So, you know, there's no free lunch here. You know, you're going to get hammered with some conservation talk here. Uh, so, qualities of light. What do I look for? This is great. I can walk around, can I? Not a lot of space, but I'm going to sit right here, I guess. Yeah, the screens on the side are, are nice because they're, well, it's all good. Color. Yeah, there's better color because we have a little bit of light spilling off here. So I avoid the harsh light in the middle of the day, okay? I, that is not my friend. Uh, I'll use it to scout locations. Um, I prefer sunset or post-sunset to beautiful days. And what I really like are days like today, which is, you know, really diffuse light. Um, when I was in Manhattan, I was here for uh, eight years. When I decided I wanted to be a photographer, I came to Manhattan and said, I'm going to be a photographer. I don't care what it is that I'm shooting. Um, and I did everything. I did not shoot for Playboy, but I did shoot models. Uh, I shot still lifes, I shot a lot of corporate annual reports, and the lighting that we used, ideal lighting for most of the location work I did, we used these big diffusers, like this big, okay, and we had a strobe in them, and then we had a little piece of cardboard in front, and the light bounced off the cardboard and back into the back of the strobe box, and then it came through a silk in the front, and it just made a really beautiful, soft light. Pretty reminiscent of what's happening here in the, you know, in the foreground here. And overcast days are just God's big light bank, okay? And it's just beautiful, soft light coming down. And uh, I love these kind of days, especially when it's raining. Um, it really makes the foliage shine, you know? And then a lot of times I'll use a polarizer, and I'll talk about that. There's no harsh shadows, you know, you can, if you go into the forest on a sunny day and try and take a picture, you know, you come back and it's just not what you see because your camera does not have the range, even though the range has been increased from film to digital, we still are not seeing, you know, that full tonal range like you can on a beautiful overcast day. I generally will not use a, uh, I will not show the sky in the picture on an overcast day, but uh, you know, when you have a certain situation like this and you're out there on a mirror, uh, why not? And it's really great, it's probably my favorite light for doing portraits because wherever a person is or an animal is, you don't have to worry about where the sun is. It's just beautiful soft light and you know, you can just get beautiful detail straight across. And of course, fog. I love fog. You know, whenever there's fog, I'm out in it. And I live in Mystic, Connecticut, and we get a lot of fog there. And, uh, and I love to go out in it. Uh, this is one early uh, morning in the Great Smoky Mountains. Now, it's, it is overcast, but the sun has come up and it's bouncing its first rays off the really high clouds. And, it, and that light is diffusing down okay, and creating a color cast. There's no direct sun going on here. Ten minutes later, it goes up into the clouds, and you still have that beautiful diffuse light, but it's changed color, 
okay? And it's, you gotta pay attention to, you know, the quality and the color temperature of the light. Next on my list is side lighting. And side lighting generally only happens at sunrise and sunset, and you pretty much want it to be at a right angle, and that's why we call it side lighting. And a lot of times, I will use a polarizer. Again, I'll talk about that later. Um, but whether you use a polarizer or not, it's great because you know you get these nice details and patterns that will not show up, you know, in this chiroscuric effect, which wouldn't show up, you know, if you had the sun over your shoulder. Um, again, here's another sunrise shot. The first rays are hitting the volcano. Ten minutes later, the sun comes up. It changes the feel of the picture, the color temperature and the feel of it, but it's still interesting um, because it's side lit. Morning in Idaho, you can tell by where the shadows are, uh, you know, where the sun is coming from, right at a right angle. I've used a polarizing filter, and you have to be careful with a polarizer if you're using a really wide angle lens because it's not going to polarize from all the way over here to all the way over there. And what you often end up with is a darker blue spot, which, you know, a lot of times if you have nice clouds, you can hide it and not make it quite so obvious that you've done that. And I shoot aerials whenever I'm on assignment. I always try and find preferably an airplane. I used to own an airplane. I, I, uh, I was terrified of flying. And uh, the only way I could get over it was to get my own pilot's license. And I got over it to the point that I, I'm, I love being in the air, whether it's a, a hang glider or a parasailing or a helicopter. Um, and so wherever I go, I, I try and find a fixed wing because they're the cheapest. And it's one of the first things I'll do is fly. But I'll always tell the pilot, you know, we're going to fly at sunrise and sunset and we're gonna shoot directly north and directly south, okay? I want side lighting, that would be ideal. I will shoot into the sun. It's a little difficult sometimes from the air because it's hard to, to shade it, and I'll talk about that in a minute. Um, sometimes I'll ask them to dip the wing a little bit and, then, and the wing will act as a shade on my lens. But it's a little tricky, but you know, Airplanes are really range anywhere from $50 an hour for a 150 if you're out in the middle of nowhere to up to $500 an hour, which is pretty expensive. I try and avoid that. But let's say you get an airplane for 150 an hour and you're in Death Valley or Glen Canyon or somewhere, you know, you go up at sunset, not only is it the thrill of a lifetime, but you can end up with some nice pictures. Uh, I will always on the Cessnas, which is what I always ask to fly in, the window opens on the passenger side on most of them. And, the, and it'll stay open in a slipstream. So you don't have to hold it open there. So it's a pretty easy way to go out and get some nice shots. Uh, and side, light is, side lighting is also great for doing portraits. Um, the only time that I shoot portraits, you know, we always think about when we're shooting family pictures, you know, the sun's over our shoulder and, you know, it's lighting everybody up. The only time I do that is when I'm with my family and I really want to torture my relatives. <laughs> I make them all, you know, look into the sun. The pictures are always terrible, but I have a good time doing it. And I think backlighting is probably, you know, my favorite light to work with. I mean, diffuse light I love because I can work all day long. And uh, being a workaholic, it's a good thing. Um, but backlight is probably next in line or at the top of the list. The problem when you're shooting into the sun, especially with zoom lenses, is you get these lens flares that happen. You can see them right, you know, in your through your viewfinder, or if you look at your picture afterwards, it's kind of obvious. And, uh, you know, so sometimes what I'll do is, like, the sun, he's, it's starting to sink down behind the mountains there. So when it was out full between the clouds and the mountains, I was getting lens flare. And so I just kept shooting as the sun went down, and I still got the sun in the picture, but not full lens flare. 
and so I was able to, you know, then get this nice backlight effect here um, without any lens flare. This is from the air, okay, and I said it was a little difficult. I was actually in a helicopter here. So the sun has come up and it's backlighting the fog and creating these rays from the, uh, from the shadows of the trees. Again, it's backlighting. The sun's not up. The sun's actually going down, um, but it's backlight. I actually found out this uh, past weekend, there was a, 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 I met a woman out in Colorado, and she worked at a supercomputer, and they had the, the computer, it was like their five bays of the computer, and they bought this picture from Nat Geo and made it like, you know, five feet tall and sliced it up, and it's at the end of each one of the bays of the computer. The computer is called Yosemite. I mean, Yellowstone wouldn't be Yosemite, would it? Okay, here's backlighting in the Smokies. The sun is up in the sky here. And so, you know, with the long lenses, with the wide angle lenses, you can see the lens flare right away when the sun's in the pic picture or even if it's out, if it's shining into the lens. With the longer lenses, generally when you have a lens flare, it's kind of just looks washed out in an area. Uh, and so you got to put your hand out in front or something in front to create a shadow, just like I'm doing here with my eyes, okay? And so with the long lens, you know, if I've got the camera on a tripod or I'm hand holding it, I'll put my hand out like this and create this shadow. In fact, I'm so good at doing it that, look, <laughs> my left arm is three inches longer than my right. You know, if the camera is on a tripod, what I'll do is I'll use a cable release and I'll stand out here and I'll create a shadow on the lens, okay? So once you've created a shadow, put a shadow on the lens, you know you're going to cut out the lens flare. Um, and of course, you don't want to put your hand into the picture. And sometimes, you know, when the sun is really low and I've got my long lens and I'm doing this, I actually will take a couple of frames and then look at them afterwards and say, oh, my hand was in the picture. But you know, with digital photography now, and the, you know, I've got a 36 megapixel camera. Nat Geo requires us to have a camera of six megapixels or better. That means that I've got a whole lot of extra megapixels. So, so let's say I'll go a little bit wider and I'll put my hand into the frame. I can crop it later. Okay, and this is something that, you know, I'm having a hard time getting used to with film. You know, that slide came back and it had to be perfect. I didn't do anything to it. I didn't crop it later. But now, you know, I was on the ship in Alaska last month and I'm following these humpback whales. There's three of them and they're breathing like this. And right over here, another one breached. Well, because I was so tight in on these, I missed that one. So let's say I had gone wider, okay, with the idea I can crop it later you know, and I'm still following them, and something happens over here, well, I could crop off half my picture, okay, and I still have, what, a, a 16 megapixel picture. So, I mean, it's something that it's not, goes against everything that I believe in as far as photography is concerned, which is you shoot it and get it right the first time. But, you know, there is that option to crop. So this is, you know, the sun is up, and then 10 minutes later, when the sun goes down below the horizon, you don't have to worry about flare, flare anymore, but it's still nice backlighting. And I love to do portrait work backlit, you know, and if you're doing models, if, you, if you're shooting models, and especially blondes, when they have the backlighting, you know, they have a nice rim light around the hair, which is great, and then sometimes you can use a little fill flash one thing that you definitely want to do when you get your camera, whether it's a point-and-shoot camera or a digital SLR that has a pop-up flash, the first thing I do is I'll go into the menu and I'll take that flash compensation and I'll take it down two stops. Okay, those camera manufacturers make these flashes that just blow out the picture. They look terrible when you use them. But if you take this flash compensation and take it down, so, you know, I like to use a flash so that you don't know I've used it, okay? Just to fill in the light a little bit. I didn't use it here, um, 
So it's just a matter of exposing correctly when you're in this situation. And a lot of the cameras now actually have a setting that says backlight. And so what it does is it overexposes a little bit on uh, what, you're fo what you're exposing on. And you see, so the background's a little overexposed, but that's properly exposed. And if I'm shooting into the sun and the sun is high and I'm going to obviously get lens flare, I try and hide the, the sun behind something, okay? And since I'm in nature photography, it's often a tree that I'm trying to hide it behind. And the last kind of light that I work with is magic light. And what is magic light? You know, there's no defining magic light. Magic light is when you look at it and you go, oh my God, look at that. You know, it's like... This was a foggy day. The fog pulled out for 200 yards. I got the shot, and then the fog came in again. You know, that was a storm that was approaching, and about a minute later, it was raining like hell on me. This is in the Seychelles. The, sun, the sunset was great. The sun went down, but I didn't leave because I had Alpen Glow uh, coming. And a lot of times you get really good light just before it gets dark. And of course, rainbows. Um, it's the only time that I will shoot with the sun over my shoulder. Because you have to have that situation where the sun's here and it's raining there. And, uh, and no polarizer. Because a lot of times the polarizer will actually polarize the rainbow right out of the picture. And I, this is magic light because I waited for like an hour and a half as this, you know, these different rays of light were going across the landscape. And what I wanted was one ray of light on the town. And God was waiting till the sun got low before the spot came on. So like I said, I never shoot with the sun over my shoulder except for when I do. Okay, I'm allowed to break my own rules. And uh, in this situation, you know, I was driving on the highway, it was an overcast day, it was completely overcast the whole time, and then I saw that it was clear all the way from the east, all the way to the north, and all the way to the west. So I knew the sun was going to drop under the clouds and just have golden light for about a minute. And so I got off the highway and I was looking around, driving around, I found this barn, and I didn't find the picture yet, and the sun came out. And so... I didn't have any time, I just took a picture, there's my shadow, I'm waving to the camera. Um, and another time I was down in Redding, Pennsylvania, same thing happened, uh, it was overcast, it actually had been storming, and you can see the storm clouds are just quickly, really quickly moving out. And I saw the sun was going to drop underneath, and so I looked around for a barn, I was in, down in Amish country, and uh, I didn't see a barn or anything. I found this field of tomatoes, and I went out and set up the tripod. I had a really wide angle lens, and I started working it. And then I saw these two girls on the road, and they were Amish girls, and they were on the bicycles. So I called them over, and I was talking to them. And I mean, they were classic looking. And so, you know, they had picked the tomatoes, and I chatted them up until the light got right. And then I asked them if they would stand in there so I could take their picture. And I got this shot. And you can see it's kind of side lit, um, somewhat over my shoulder, because look at her shadow there. But uh, that worked pretty well. So that's a 15 millimeter lens. And I generally don't use it for portrait work because it does really strange things to people's heads and stuff. But if, the, if you put the subject right in the middle of the frame when you're shooting wide angle like that, uh, you can get away with it. Oh, and here's a little example of, you know, how light changes. I was at Canyon de Chez. It's a beautiful place. If you ever go out west, you got the Grand Canyon, you got Monument Valley, and you got Canyon de Chez, all within driving distance of each other. And uh, so I was here, and I found this nice little lookout, and that was the picture. And I came back one morning at sunrise, and there was this kind of storm going on here, and uh, it was raining, so I thought, well, maybe there'll be a rainbow. So I stuck around, and then the sky lit up. Problem was, I'm facing directly west, and the sun is rising over my shoulder, and you know I don't like that. And uh, 
So I got that, and then I got my rainbow. And then I got a, you know, a complete rainbow across. But the problem was the sun was still over my shoulder. There's nothing going on down here of interest. It's flat. I mean, it looks better on the little monitors, but still the light is flat. And so the picture is really here, okay? And then I returned that evening and, uh, and got this shot, okay? But it's still, maybe this is the next morning because look, it looks like the light is still over here. But anyways, the point is, you know, that flat light is flat light. There's not much you can do with it when it's over your shoulder. So tips on seeing light, get up early, which unfortunately the older I get, the earlier I get up, you know. It's funny, I, when I'm at home, I get, you know, I wake up at three, four in the morning, I got a million things I'm thinking about, you know, and I'm up and doing them. When I go on location, I've got one thing to think about. It's really wonderful. It's just what it is that I have to do that day on assignment. I sleep much better. It's like the alarm goes off. It's like, oh, damn, it's five in the morning. I have to get up. Whereas in, at home, I'm up like that. I got to turn that around. Change your position, okay? So stay, get up early, stay out late, stay until it's dark. And sometimes when it's dark and it's clear, you can shoot uh, Milky Way shots. And the digital cameras are amazing. They're much better than the film uh, used to be. Change your position to control the light. And this is something that I still do. If I see something that I really like, I'll shoot it from where I see it, okay? Because that's usually the shot, okay? And then I'll work it. I'll, I'll walk around it. I'll shoot it backlighting. I'll walk around it over here. I'll shoot it side lit here. I won't walk over there with the sun over my shoulder, but if it's diffuse, I will. So often when I see a picture that I like, It'll usually, nine times out of 10, it's either the first frame, the where I see it, or it's the last frame. Sometimes it's just, you gotta work a situation um, until you get it right. Okay, elements of composition. This is pretty simple stuff. Uh, you all have heard rules of third. Let me ask you, how many people here are shooting raw? Okay, more and more all the time. And how many people are shooting point-and-shoot cameras? Okay, I have my point-and-shoot camera. This is my favorite point-and-shoot camera. I love this camera. Oh, what is that? I'm going to talk to you later about this one. Oh, do you have a, you have a like a, that's your, your tripod. Do you have a, a telephoto to go on the, on the phone? Oh. Just wide angle. And telephoto. Oh, I was driving in here today and I got off, I came in on the west side, on the west side highway, and I got off, you, you can pull off and there's like a little park there, and I look back at the George Washington Bridge and there's that red lighthouse underneath the George Washington Bridge. It was beautiful. Now, all I had was my iPhone. I'm like going, how do I zoom in on that, all right? <laughs> so, uh, yeah, rules of third, leading lines, frames within frames, and repeating patterns. Now, these are rules about composition, and I believe that all rules should be broken, especially the ones about composition. And, I, and you, what I would say, you know, learn the rules, but more importantly, go to the museums, because the more art you see, the more you expose yourself to art, uh, the more it will become second nature to you. You won't have to think about it. I don't ever think about, you know, when I'm taking a picture, I don't think, oh, let's see, should I put the picture, should I put the subject over here? I just come up to a subject, I just see it a certain way, you know, and it just, without thinking. And that's really, you know, where you want to get to, and sometimes it's like, before you can play a piano, you have to learn the scales. And if you think about the rules of composition, you know, those are the scales. And if you play them long enough and you, you know, and you play them well enough, you don't have to think about them anymore, okay? You just make music. So, you know, here's the rules of thirds. The idea is that you put your subject where they intersect, okay? You don't want to put it right in the middle. You know, here, and I believe me, I did, this is an afterthought, okay? 
oh, isn't that nice it worked out that the sun was in this third and the walrus skull was over in this third. So, I mean, ideally, you're supposed to put something in one of these intersecting spots. But, you know, like I said, they're really, the rules are made to be broken. There's only two rules you don't want to break. One is don't put the sun over your shoulder, right? Except like, when you do. Except for when you do. Well, when I do. <laughs> and, uh, and don't put the subject in the middle of your frame every time, except for when you do, right? <laughs> so here's another shot. Okay, here's, you know, perfectly in that intersection there of that third. Didn't think about it when I was shooting. Same thing here. Didn't think about it at all. She just, I was doing this story on Bristol Bay, and I'll be telling, showing you pictures. Uh, and she just picked up that fish and kissed it and said, I love these fish. And, uh, you know, I didn't ask her to do it again, although I wanted to, but luckily I got it the first time. Okay, leading lines. And I, I like diagonals and leading lines, and they add depth. Okay, so I mean, this is a really cool lighting. This is that same town, right? So after it came, after I got it up on the hill, and then I drove down the hill. I was up here when I shot that other one, and then I came down, and the sun actually came out again on the church. And so I had this foreground, and I had these diagonal lines to give it a little movement. Okay, same thing here. You know, you, you have this little line, or you can take it to the next step, and call it an S-curve, okay? And S-curves are great, you know, look at this, coming down here. I had an assistant who I worked with forever uh, who was a train buff, and that's what he did. He shot trains, okay? We would have a shoot in Utah or something, and then, you know, we had a ton of equipment with us, and he'd say, oh, do you mind if I stay here because I want to shoot trains? And then he'd find that train looking at topo maps where there was that S-curve, and he'd sit there on the hillside and wait for a train to come by. Yeah, boy, what a tough way to make a picture, you know. The light's perfect, you got the S-curve, and you don't have a train, you know. <laughs> the sun is out, everything's great. You can hear the train, he's around the corner. Yeah, anyways, I, obviously the guy liked to torture himself because he worked for me for about 20 years, so. <laughs> I mean, how about that for an S-curve? That just goes on forever. Sand dunes are great to work with patterns and S-curves. Um, Death Valley, I recommend Death Valley. It has the largest sandbox in the U.S. Um, it happens to be the largest national park in the lower 48. It's the lowest, 282 feet below sea level, up to 11,000 feet. So anything that you want, you can find in Death Valley. And if, we ha if they have a lot of rain out west, um, they have amazing wildflowers, usually February, March, sometime around there. I don't think they had a lot of rain this year. And frames within frames, okay? I don't use this very much, but it can be very effective. I mean, it's just something to think about and be aware of. You know, you're shooting something, you know, especially in the city, you know. The city is a great place to use frames within frames and reflections off windows. I love shooting reflections off windows when I'm in the city. See, and the frame that you're using doesn't have to be in focus. In fact, you can throw it so far out of focus that all it is is a color. Okay, so I got the Canon 100 to 400. I'm focusing on the eye here, but I've got foliage really close to the lens, and all it's doing is just making a soft little blur around the frame to just give it, you know, a little bit of atmosphere, and the opposite of red is green. So they work well together. And repeating patterns work really well. I love repeating patterns. And this happens to be Death Valley, as is this. The one thing about Death Valley, if you go there, there's, you know, there are, there's two little motels that are pretty inexpensive that you can stay at there in the valley. Uh, but you have these incredible sand dunes. But there's so many photographers now that everyone's out there photographing. You take a picture and then you look at it later and go, oh, there are footprints right through. So you gotta, you gotta wait for a, a sandstorm to come along, a windstorm, 
and then you want to be the first one out there. This is uh, some mudstone in uh, Glacier National Park. I'm just looking down, walking along the side of the lake, and I just saw it's about this wide. I just saw this pattern in the mudstone, and there was no wind, okay? So I was able to shoot straight down. I came back a couple of days later, and the wind had blown, knocked all the mudstone down. It was completely flat and of no interest. More repeating pattern. It's a glacial outflow. Okay, with a braided river, and uh, I'm from an, an airplane. I'm looking down from about 500 feet, looking down on this. So it's that color because the glaciers, what they do, as the ice moves down the valley, it's grinding up that granite rock, and it creates the silty uh, color. It's kind of like rock powder in the water. Okay, so tips uh, for creative composition. Place the subject and the horizon off the center. Frame with the foreground and be selective and keep it simple. Um, I'm big on keeping pictures simple. Oh, I'm going to run out of battery power. Okay. Okay, so let's talk about what's in my bag. Okay. Ah, it's Canon. Since we're here at B&H, we don't discriminate between camera companies here, okay? Because guess what else? I've got Nikon, too. <laughs> so, uh, these, this is what's in my bag, and it's exactly the same now that I've converted to Nikon, okay? So let's look in here. I've got, I used to have a fanny pack with, when I shot film, I had one camera body. I like to really be able to move light and keep it simple. And I had one camera body, and I had a wide angle lens, usually it was a 20, then I had an 85, and then I had a 200. And that was it, and they were all prime lenses, because back when I shot film, the zoom lenses were not as good as the primes. Well, they are pretty spectacular now. They still may not be quite if you're a pixel counter, but I'm not, and Nat Geo's never rejected a picture of mine uh, taken with this soft lens, the 100 to 400. I've had many of them run in Nat Geo. And then someone else pointed out that my 24 to 105 is a soft lens. So two out of three lenses that I shot with when I shot with Canon were not up to snuff, uh, according to the techies. So uh, I used to use one camera body and I would just change the lenses. But when we went to digital, Every time you took that lens off, you got some dust coming into your sensor. And, you know, it's better now than it was in the beginning. But you get one piece of dust on your sensor and every single picture has that dust on it. And it's, it makes me crazy. And so I carry two camera bodies, one with a long lens and one with a wide angle. So this is a 16 to 35. This is a 100 to 400. Then I got a little smarter and I changed this camera to the 70 so it wasn't full frame. So my 100 to 400 then became what? A 200 to 500 or, or more uh, because it wasn't full frame. But if I wanted the full frame, I could just switch lenses. And this was full frame. I make a little, a, a little color on one camera. Uh, one was red and the other was green because I live on the water and that's you know the marine symbol. Uh, yellow and green, uh, yellow, red, and green, right? And uh, so long lens, wide angle. Then here I have my filters, which I'll talk about in a minute. Uh, over here I had the middle range lens, which here was the 24105, extra batteries. I had my point and shoot in here or, and or my cable release, my point and shoot being uh, Canon G9, and then I graduated to the G10. Now they're al already up to a G12, I think, right? Is there a new one? 15? There's a G15? Yeah, they didn't want to do 13, so then they figure they skip one, they'll skip two. Oh, so what's so much better about the 15 than the 12? It, it, is it heavier? Because I noticed the difference between my 10 and the 12 is significant uh, in weight and size. I'll have to go look at that afterwards. It's not available? 
I definitely want it then if it's not available. <laughs> That's funny. Uh, and then I have uh, headlamps because I like to work on the edge of darkness. Uh, and I used to have in here um, a couple of things, gaffer's tape. Sam, where's my gaffer's tape? You put it back in the bag? Yeah. Of course. Good. I'm training him. <laughs> uh, and I had a bubble level, you know, the level you can put on the hot shoe. Well, the Nikon is really cool now. Actually, I think Canon may have it now in, light, in live view. You've got the level right there. I love that. Actually, in the Nikon, you can push a button, and you can see at the bottom there's a little level, which is great. Uh, and then in here, I had my, my macro attachments. Okay. Um, so for close-up, I love doing close-up. And then, of course, look. Got to have the manuals because, you know, the, my new Nikon manual, it weighs more than the camera. <laughs> Same thing here, 1635. 70 to 200, which is a beautiful lens. Uh, there's the cable release. 24 120 is the Nikon's. Filters, batteries, headlamps. Same thing. Keep it simple. What camera is that? This is the D800. That's the camera that made me switch to Nikon. 36 megapixel. I have one without the anti alias glass, the E. And then I have two of the other ones. Um, and I love it, but if I'm looking, does it really, can I tell the difference between the Canon and the Nikon? I cannot, okay? Maybe if I did a little pixel counting, I might, but you know, it's really the eye um, and getting used to it. So I'm just gonna review with you the lenses here, 1635, why do I like this lens? I love this lens, this is my normal lens. In fact, I, I like it too much. Okay, and I'm always looking for a long lens shot because I like the 1635, that wide angle. Foreground, middle ground, background. Okay, a lot of my pictures and landscape shots, if you look at Ansel Adams' shots, you know, my hero, there's always foreground, middle ground, background. Same thing here. This is in California, foreground. What's going on here? Something interesting going on in the middle and, you know, Okay, it's a bad scan, but there's something going on in the background. Same thing here, foreground, middle ground, background. It's just that wide angle perspective that I love. Now, when I'm shooting in the air, I usually only take one lens with me in the airplane because there's a lot going on. You've got your lenses behind you in the camera, in the seat behind you, or if you're flying in a 152, which is a lot cheaper, or a 150, there's just two seats. You've got nothing behind you. So just take your camera body, one body, you know, hope it works, one lens. You know, you could take a second body, but I, I might take a second body before I take a second lens. That 24 to 105 or the 24 to 120 is all you need from the air, okay? This is off the Nepali coast. I actually shot this from a hang glider, a motorized hang glider, because they uh, did away with the helicopters there. So what do I use the 24 to 105 for? It's, you know, it's a decent portrait lens. Uh, I'll use it for that and for little details um, and for macro. Middle, you know, patterns, just kind of normal looking stuff. I mean, if I was a really good photographer, I'd carry one lens, it would be a 50 millimeter lens because that's how we see, okay? To me, it's the most boring thing. Okay, I had never shoot with a 50 millimeter lens. I mean, if I was really disciplined, that's what I would do. But clearly I'm not, okay? And so I shoot wide angles so much that I am always looking for that 400 millimeter shot, that long lens shot that compresses everything. It's essential when you're shooting wildlife that long lens, and it compresses everything. This is a, a funny story I'll share with you. This was in Alaska, Wrangell St. Elias. I had found this pilot. Actually, there was an article on him in Outside Magazine. They called him the best pilot in the world. His name's Paul Smith, and uh, he runs a lodge up there. And so I like to shoot air to air. I said, well, you know, it'd be really cool. You have a red plane. Let's do some air to air where you're flying around in front of uh, 
St. Elias Mountain. And he goes, no, you know, we don't really need to do that. I'll just land somewhere and let you get out. Well, I mean, look at this terrain. Where are you going to land? <laughs> he, yeah, he landed on a little shelf like this. And he landed and he kind of went up like this. And then just before he stalled, he turned the plane and face down. And he turned to me and goes, you can get out now. <laughs> I'm like, what? <laughs> yeah. So I got out, and then, you know, I mean, it's not very, it's not as long as a runway, right? It's not very long at all. So he just guns it, and he just goes shooting off the end of the snow and disappears. He goes down, and he gained enough speed and enough power that, and enough lift that he took off. And then, he, you know, he's flying around there, and I'm shooting. All the time, I'm praying that he actually comes back to get me. Yeah. And then, sure enough, yep, he came back, picked me up. He did the same thing. He landed right on that shelf and turned around. Yeah, the bush pilot, the best bush pilot. Yeah, it's amazing what they can do. I mean, I, you know, I've landed on beaches down there, glaciers. You know, they have these big tires. You know, I mean, that was a, that was a ski plane, right? But they, some of them have, you can see the skis there? Yep. Okay, some of them have these tires that are like this, and they can just, you know, they land on the beach, they land on glaciers, you know, gla ice fields, really, not glaciers. You don't want to go into a crevasse. What else is in my bag? Well, my favorite camera, because it's always with me. And it's amazing. Okay, it's a little pixelated, but... You know, I'm in my backyard, and all of a sudden this cloud just does this. You know, you just pull the camera out of your pocket. And also you want to do it because, gee, everyone else is shooting, you know, with the other cameras. I mean, this was amazing. This was at Angkor Wat, and I got up at, I was there with a group through uh, National Geographic Expeditions. Uh, we went around the world in 24 days. And it's really, I mean, you got to see all the hot spots that you want to see in your lifetime. 11 countries, 24 days, and it only cost $65,000 a person. <laughs> I was getting paid to be there. So, uh, so we got up at 4 o'clock. Sun's rising at 6.40. Got up at 4, had tea at 4.30. We went out to Angkor Wat. By the time we got there at like 5.00, it was like three deep. I mean, it was like, and I kept going down the line asking people if I could just kneel at their feet under there. They all kissed, you know, like I've been here for an hour. There's no way I'm going to let you come in. And I finally met a really nice Frenchman somewhere in there and said, sure enough, you know, come sit at my feet. And so I set up the tripod there. Oh, this was a shot after. So by the time the sun rose, it was five deep. I mean, and that's what happens every day. And this is what digital photography has done. It's created a revolution, okay? It's so easy to take good pictures. It's so much fun because you get to see it right away. And if it's not good right away, you can make it good later. Uh, that I think it's a great thing. Um, of course, I would prefer if we all went back to film when you, know, you went like this, you either got it or you didn't. But it is what it is. So I set up the camera, and I got this shot, okay? And everyone's behind me. I'm kneeling there, which is great. Then I thought, oh, I wonder how it would look with the iPhone. So I put the iPhone on top of my camera that's on my tripod and held it there, and I got this picture. <laughs> I mean, why do you need anything else, really, right? I mean, which picture do you like better? Okay, that one's good, but that one's not bad either, all right? And so I embraced the iPhone, and there was a bunch of apps for the iPhone, right? There's Instamatic, Hipstamatic, not Instamatic, Hipstamatic, makes us all hipsters. And there's a, I was on this trip around the world, and there was a woman from Louisiana. She used to be a, uh, a prison warden. And she told me about this app called Camera Plus. How many of you have Camera Plus? I love this app. So this is a picture out of the bus, backlit, okay, you can't see detail in there at all. I ran it through Camera Plus, and look what I get. I mean, is that amazing? Don't we wish our regular cameras could do that? 
This guy went by, same building, okay, it was like two seconds later, the guy went by, shot, I'm getting lens flare, probably either from the window or from the camera, run it through camera plus. Look at the detail. I mean, this is really stunning. You know, just a boring picture. Again, shot from the bus, run it through camera plus. There's another app there or another option. I was in Nantucket, it was raining. I can't even keep the uh, horizon level. So there's raindrops on the window, run it through camera plus, crop it into a panoramic. Not a bad shot, just amazing. And I haven't even played with the iPhone 5 yet. Actually, I ordered it for my son because he was eligible for an upgrade. So I have to wait for him to come home from college next week. And then we're going to go down to the store and switch SIM cards. I get the new one. He gets my old one. That's fair, don't you think? <laughs> Do you have to tell Seniority. Well, no, what happened actually years ago when the, when the phone first came out, the iPhone first came out, I said to him, if you come home with straight A's, you get the phone. You get an iPhone. And he came home with straight A's, and sure enough, we went down to this store. What I really wanted was an iPhone for myself, right? So we go down to this store, and we went in, and it's like, yep, get my son an iPhone, sign him up, there he is. And I said, well, I'll have one too. And Oh, well, you're not really eligible. It's going to cost you, you know, $400 rather than $200. It's like, oh, I can't do that. So I went home for about two days. He had the iPhone, and I didn't. Two days later, I went back, and $400 later. It was worth it though. Yeah. How large, how, how, who's printed iPhone pictures? How, how large can we go, Lucian? Uh, I've gone up to 14 by 18, 19, 20. 20 inches? Yeah. And they're good. Yeah. 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 And, oh, is that right? The facing camera is Oh, rather than the other one. Oh, that's good to know. Do you hear that? If you're shooting with the iPhone, you want to shoot out, okay, rather than taking a picture of yourself, because you know it's going to be better that way anyways, right? <laughs> At least for me, it is. That one's <laughs> lower res, but faster reaction, so you can do online talking back and forth. Oh, the FaceTime one is a lower res, but faster. Yeah. Amazing. I would really love it if Apple just gave us a little bit more instruction with their stuff. And I tell you, driving into New York yesterday, huh? The HDR, but didn't we have the HDR and the 4S? Yeah, and the 5 is a good one. Yeah. But what was up with the maps? I came into New York yesterday, I actually got lost, and I knew New York, I know New York like the back of my hand, and it actually gave me faulty directions. So I used Wave this morning. Is it Waze? Waze, it's a Google map thing. Yeah. So, Polarizer, I've mentioned it a couple of times, right? And uh, I'm gonna talk about how many people don't use a Polarizer? Okay, so everyone else is on board. Uh, what, a di what a difference, okay? No Polarizer? Polarizer. You got to turn it, right? And what it does is you got light is scattered everywhere out there. And what a polarizer does, it kind of eliminates a lot of the scattered light and lines up your light in nice rows. And basically what it does is it takes reflection uh, off of water objects. Uh, it's great for foliage when it's raining. Uh, you got to turn it all the time. I have polarizing sunglasses and I'm all the time walking down the street like this. Do you have a sore neck? No. <laughs> nice sunset? You don't really need a polarizer, but if you do polarize it, it's, uh, it, it helps it immensely. I have three lenses, I have three polarizers. They're always on the camera. And these days, sometimes I actually won't even bother to take them off. I'll just bump my ISO up. When I shot film, it was always 50 ISO or ASA at that time. Can the lens hood on or the rigid lens? The lens hood uh, with, a, with a wide angle, I don't have a lens hood. With a telephoto, I take it off and I turn it and then I put it back on. Yeah, it'd be nice. Who makes a lens hood? There's a, 
I heard there's somebody who makes one where they have a little cut in it, and you can actually touch it. With the longer lenses, the 500, the 600, I can't afford a 600, so I'll say the 500, you can put a polarizer in that has a little dial on it. And a polarizer, a drop-in polarizer, is about this big. But it does eat up a stop and two-thirds of light. Okay, so it's something to consider. Uh, and the point is that with film, I was very cognizant of it. So if the polarizer didn't do anything, I took the polarizer off. With digital, especially with the newer cameras getting better and better all the time with noise, I'll just bump the ISO up. I don't have to shoot at ISO 50 anymore. In fact, I don't even think I can with the Nikon. It starts at 100. Okay, so I think nothing of shooting ISO 1200. Now here's a boring picture. Not interesting at all, but I'm just using it as an illustration. Facing directly north at sunset, if I polarize it, it really makes it semi-interesting. Like I was saying before, foliage, whether it's raining or not, you know, it's a nice picture, it's a nice diffuse overcast day. You don't think you'd use a polarizer, but if you polarize it, it just takes the, a little glare off. I'm sorry I didn't have the camera on a tripod, otherwise you'd see it directly what it does. See all the shine on the leaves? And you polarize it and it takes that shine off and especially around water, especially in the Caribbean. This happened to have been the Seychelles. Just used it as an illustration. You polarize it, you can see right into the water. So I like to fly fish. I'm always wearing polarizing sunglasses because I can actually see the fish, which is cheating, according to them, but not listening to them. So here, and it works great with water, okay, and streams. You can see the, the shine off of that stream and off the rocks. By turning the polarizer, it takes it all off. Again, I talked about earlier, this situation where you end up with a real dark spot as opposed to a white spot, I mean, or a lighter spot. When I see a picture like this, just like when I see a picture with a fisheye, a lot of times I won't see the picture. I'll look at the picture and say, polarizer, he messed up. Or I'll look at a fisheye and go, that's not a picture, it's a fisheye. Do you have a question? Yeah, sorry. Would you if I was shooting a portrait, would I recommend it? No, generally I don't use it for people because uh, sometimes it actually makes the skin almost too saturated. Um, it depends on the lighting though, really. Um, in general, I like to shoot people in overcast situations and if it's sunny out, I'll put them in the shade and I will not use a polarizer. So generally I don't use a polarizer when shooting people. Here's a situation where a boat was coming through the canyon and I had the polarizer on to darken the sky over here and then what I did was I turned it and it, what it did was it darkened the water instead and I preferred that. And sometimes you can actually get it so it darkens both. And it took all the shine off of the water and it made the boat pop out. If I hadn't have used it, you, you know, the boat would have barely been visible. And what, what's that? I can't tell you, secret. <laughs> no, it's called uh, Reflection Canyon in Glen Canyon. And Glen Canyon is what the canyon that existed before they flooded Lake Powell. Um, so we, I like to call it Glen Canyon. And I was there shooting a story for Geographic because they had a drought out west so bad you can see that the water level had dropped from here all the way down, so it was starting to reveal the beautiful canyon that existed there before they flooded it. I mean, could you imagine if they flooded the Grand Canyon? You know, they thought about it, right? Meanwhile, this canyon is getting filled up with silt, right? All the water's coming down, all the silt's coming down the river, but there's a dam there. And so eventually what's gonna happen, it's all gonna fill up with silt, just like Lake Mead. Same thing. Um, and then who knows what will happen. Now, graduated neutral density filter. Uh, I'll use it just to bring the exposure difference in the sky as opposed to the shadow area more in line. And at geographic, we cannot manipulate any pictures. In other words, we cannot move 
pyramids. We cannot move telephone lines. <laughs> What's that? There's always somebody who. It wasn't me, thank God. Yeah, the editor got fired when he did that. Yeah, so he moved the pyramids to line them up. So that's why I said we don't do that anymore. We don't take trash. If there's a little piece of trash in the picture, we can't take it out. But we can dodge and burn. We can take the color a little one way or the other. They want us to, to show the picture the way we saw it. And I want my digital pictures to look like they would if I shot them on film. And so I will use the graduated neutral density filter just to bring it all within range, okay? We don't want to blow out the highlights, right? You're all aware of that. You have that little flasher on the back of your camera going, so if you do overexpose it too much, it's flashing at you. And so I'll just use the, polar, the graduated neutral density to darken an area, in this case it's the sky, to bring it within range. And with film, I, that was it, that was the end of it. But with digital, it's just a tool that helped me take it to the next level. So by using the graduated neutral density filter here, you can't tell I've used it. Okay, I've done nothing to this picture other than shot it. I can see all the way down into these deep shadows and I'm still getting the sun up on the cloud up here. And If you turn it upside down, it'll work on the bottom part, or if okay. it's if it's brighter. So it goes into a sliding filter. It's a square piece of plastic, okay? And I usually use two-stop soft graduate. So, so it's very gradual graduation from two stops darker to clear. Now, uh, you, you cannot get the same results in Photoshop with some of the mixed filters? You can, and, and you can but you have to start with the full tonal range, okay? So if I'm shooting this picture and I'm not using the graduated neutral density filter, I may be blowing out the sky here a little bit, okay? Uh, I can underexpose it a little bit, but then I'm gonna be blocking up the shadows here. So I use it as a tool to bring my histogram from out here to in here, okay? So if it's too far to the left and too far to the right, so you know I'm going to blow out the highlights, I'll just bring that highlight down wherever it is. It could be, you know, like if I was shooting in this room and all of you were dark and the, sun, and the light was over here, I turn the, the graduated neutral density filter this way and darken the windows over there and lighten you guys up. And then just, just to bring it within range, here's a good example, even a better example, even over here, okay, look at this detail down in the shadow. I've got full kick here. This is full sunlight. Okay, yeah, it is setting sun, but that cloud is so high that, you know, the difference between here and here is outside of my range, okay? Yeah, six, seven, eight stops, whatever. So uh, I just bring the graduated neutral density filter down to bring it within range, and then I can use aperture, Lightroom, you know, Photoshop, whatever program you use to tweak it from there, you know, and then you can lighten another area or darken another area. But I, this is a straight shot with the graduated neutral density filter. Now, something that we cannot use at Geographic, but I know Ansel Adams is screaming to get back here, okay? Because this is what Ansel is all about. You know, he exposed for the shadows, he developed for the highlights, he was a master technician as well as a master photographer. How many people are playing with HDR? Okay, so more of you should if you're doing landscapes. You gotta have the camera and a tripod. You're shooting three to five exposures with like two stops in between. Okay, and here's a couple of examples. Like I said, we don't, we can't use it at Nat Geo and so I don't play with it at all because even if I if I do play with it, or if I manipulate pictures or retouch pictures and it gets out, even though I'm not working for Nat Geo, if people think of me and think of Art Wolf in the same vein, okay, moving zebras around or manipulating pictures, I, Art is a great photographer. He'll never work for Nat Geo because people know that he will manipulate his pictures. So I have to be pure all the time, well, at least in photography. Yes? What about the, those uh, cameras that let you do the 
HDR in camera. The, the HDR in camera. Oh, see, well, see, we send our raw files. See, they don't, it's not that they don't trust us, but they don't trust us, okay? <laughs> so we have to send them the original raw file. So what I do is I'll go out and shoot everything raw. Then I sit for days in front of the computer when I get home, and I'll tweak each frame or set of frames to make them look the way I want them to look. And then I'll, I'll put JPEGs and send them down to my editor. And then they'll, you know, edit from there. And then you sit in a room, you, throw, you show 40 in the end, they pick 10 pictures to publish, they ask for those raw files. If they can't make the same picture from the raw file, they'll come back to me and say, you know, what did you do here? In fact, one case, uh, Wild and Scenic Rivers, it was a pretty simple thing. I took a picture on a pretty hazy day, uh, and I know it was vivid green when I shot it, and when it came back, it looked terrible. It was just, you know, like raw files do, right? And they came back to me and said, we can't run this picture. And I said, well, here's my XMP file, and all I did with in Lightroom was I took the black point and dragged it all the way down. So I took this histogram, we were talking about the, using the uh, graduated neutral density filter and taking a histogram that looked like this and bringing it here. Well, I had a histogram that looked like this. I took my black point here and my white point there, and it looked beautiful. And that's all they had to do. Um, so back to HDR. To, Put the camera on a tripod, you do one exposure the best you can in the middle. Then you do another exposure for the highlights, right? In other words, two stops underexposed. You do another exposure for the shadows, in other words, two stops overexposed. You put them together with a program called Photomatics. Is there anything else besides Photomatics? Lightroom, your Lightroom, you can, it, uh, you can export them to uh, Photomatics. Photoshop has HDR now too? Is that five? Six. Six. HDR Chrome? Pro. Oh, okay. Yeah. So then you run it through one of these softwares and you end up with a picture with a full tonal range. I mean, that is, I can't get that picture if I don't do <laughs> HDR. And I mean, that's so much better that picture to me than the picture I shot, no matter what I do to it. I mean, you know, I'd be all over this. As soon as geographic stops calling, I'm going to be HDRing. Okay. But if you don't know what you're doing, what's that? And you know what? If you don't know what you're doing in HDR, here's a, here's a good example. Okay. Overexposed, underexposed, simple. Put it together. What do you end up with? Something that's really weird. Okay, that is not a photograph that I'm going to ever put my name on. Okay. Strange stuff to people. Oh, I've never seen it. That person has to stand still though for three frames, right? But if it's used subtly, okay, it's not. You know, you have to look and see. I ran this through HDR, and all it did or I, all I wanted it to do was just to bring up the shadows a little bit, okay? See the difference there? Before and after. Now clearly I could have probably done this in Lightroom, you know, either with that graduated neutral density filter or the, or the brush filter. Okay, so now moving on to hidden Alaska. Uh, I've been to Alaska a lot and uh, I, uh, have been very lucky there. And I, at Geographic, you know, you propose, half the stories you see in the magazine have been proposed by the photographers. And so you got to constantly be proposing new ideas. And I'd been to Alaska enough times that I proposed to do a story on Katmai National Park, which is right here. That's where, how many people have been to Katmai? Yeah, that is where you, you know, you all know the picture I think Mangelson was the first one to shoot it with a bear with its mouth open and the salmon jumping in. So there is a waterfall there called Brooks Falls and there is a campground and uh, cabins that you can stay in uh, called Brooks Camp. 
and you can walk up this trail and you stand on a wooden platform and you all get to take the same picture that Tom took years ago. Um, and so I thought, well, how can I go wrong? I'll propose the story on Katmai. Katmai is just an amazing place anyways. So I proposed that and then they came back and said, well, we like you, you know, what you do in Alaska, but we have something more important uh, up in Bristol Bay. Ah, but I've gotten ahead of myself. So save what I just said about that. Uh, so years ago, uh, before I got my foot in the door at the Yellow Magazine, which was 10 years ago, I worked for 15 years for Traveler before that, always trying to get my foot in the door at the Yellow Magazine. And before Traveler, I worked for a number of years at the Books Division at Geographic. And before that, it was the Kids Magazine. So that was my, you know, it was the natural progression. Kids Magazine promoted to, to Books, promoted to Traveler, promoted to the Yellow Magazine. And I never really thought I would ever get to the Yellow Magazine. Um, but the Books Division gave me a three-month assignment to go to Alaska and to go wherever I wanted to go and to spend as much as I wanted and to do two books. And so they said, where do you want to go? I pulled up a map and I said, I want to go everywhere where it's green as a start and then we'll go from there. So I pretty much went to every place here on their nickel by float plane because it's the only way to get around. And my, the first time I went there, I went and landed on a glacier with uh, skis, with a ski plane, and camped out on the glacier with a few guys. And we went and skied, we mount, mountaineer skiing, where you have skins on your skis and you climb up during the day and ski down. And this is coming across a glacier. You've got to be roped up because if you fall in a, into a crevasse, uh, then you're gone. And the, the whole idea of roping up is that if you fall in a crevasse, your buddy's going to save you. Either that or you drag him in with you and you're not miserable <laughs> alone. You know, hate to die alone, you know. <laughs> and this is, I mean, look at this. This is like being in Yosemite. All oh, sheer granite cliffs going up on top of this glacier. And so that's what we would do. We would climb during the day with our skis and then we'd get up top and then we'd ski down. And we called it work. And it would be like, hey guys, here's a little cliff, why don't you jump off here? And I'll stand underneath and shoot. And then when I was done with that assignment, I went sailing in Prince William Sound. And that was cool. That was my first two assignments in, in Alaska. So then they, then they came back to me with this book idea. And so off I was to Alaska and I flew into Alaska on, com on a commercial flight. And this is what I saw out my commercial airplane window as I flew in for three months in Alaska, and I knew it was going to be a good trip. And uh, first place I went was the southeast, which is a rainforest, and went along the inside passage. And this is what it usually looks like, because it's a rainforest, it's usually raining there. And I went and stayed at a place called Misty Fjords, and uh, what a magical place that was. And uh, again, it's, they have, I don't know, it's, 300 day, 325 days of rain a year. And I got dropped off by float plane at this lake. And uh, there was a rowboat there. And the pilot was very nice and said, well, you know, I brought a motor for you for the little boat. And I was like, oh, you know, sacrilege. You know, I'm a purist. I'm not going to use the motor. But I put it on the back of the boat anyways. And I rowed around the lake that day. And I found this location. I said, well, this would be nice, you know, if we had good light later. And I rode back to the lean-to where I was staying. And then the sun started to drop below the clouds. And I was like, I got to get back to that spot. Well, I was really happy to have that motor <laughs> fired up and ran right over here. So much for being a purist. And so this is the ship that I was on uh, when I was going down the inside passage. So I had the camera. Probably on a tripod, not necessarily. I may have been holding it. Uh, and a real slow shutter speed, okay? And it's getting dark. So the slow shutter speed, the clouds are moving, the water is moving, but the boat is standing still. I love slow shutter speed pictures. And there's a lot of whales there on the inside passage. How many people have been to the inside passage? Okay, yeah. 
I mean, if you're going to go to Alaska, that's the first thing you're going to do is do the Inside Passage. I was there last month with uh, Nat Geo Expeditions. Uh, we lead these photo groups, these photo tours, which are great. And uh, it doesn't matter what level of photography you're doing. And so I saw this, uh, I was there with my daughter, both my son and my daughter have been lucky enough to travel with me to amazing places around the world. And I was there with her and we saw this breacher. So I shot it with, I had an 85 millimeter, mm, well, maybe that was the 200, uh, to get the landscape and the whale in the picture. Then we motored over uh, and turned off the motor and waited to see if the breacher would come up again. And I know enough about whales to know they usually won't go down more than 10 minutes before they come up again. And we're standing there about 10 minutes later, my daughter turns to me and she goes, Daddy, where's the breacher? Right on cue. I mean, it, she, the words got out of her mouth and this guy came up right next to us. I, I shot that with an 85 millimeter lens. And there are glaciers calving. You know, sometimes you sit there for an hour and you wait and nothing happens and other times you get entire faces of the glacier falling off. And I camped out at a glacier called the Hubbard Glacier. Um, and it's the fastest moving glacier in North America. And so we just camped there all night long. You could just hear this thing calving off. And so I just worked it. And luckily I got this one calf with nice light. Look at this, just like a spotlight on that one area. You saw this picture before. Uh, flying around in a bush plane and you certainly saw this picture before and so this guy also he had another plane with huge tundra tires they call them and we landed here on this ice field this in, and I don't know why they always use Rhode Island but they you know they say oh there's an ice field here the size of Rhode Island yeah so yeah it's pretty amazing you just land it's all ice there and we could land on that this is the Root Glacier at Wrangell St. Elias, and I found there were a couple of women who were guides, and they said, oh, we got a great place for you to take a picture. And uh, so they were roped up. You see, she's all roped up, and she's ice climbing, and ice climbing is great. It's so easy. And I have crampons on. It is. It's just, it's like going up a ladder. You just put your pick in and kick into the snow, and you just hand over, over feet. But in this particular case, I'm sitting there, I got crampons on and I'm on a pretty steep slope. And I look down and this is a, there's a little river going right through there and goes under the glacier. And one false move and I would have ended up down there and you never would have seen me again. Meanwhile, I'm photographing these guys. They are completely safe, all roped up. And I was not roped up. <laughs> when, I, when that realization happened, I was like, oh, I'm pretty stupid here, right? And, you know, <laughs> But I, I, but I had to get the shot, right? Because the storm was coming. Oh, this is what was right underneath me. Yeah. So it was a little scary. Only when I thought about it, which luckily when I'm photographing, I'm not thinking usually. Denali National Park. I've been there five times. I've only seen it once, okay? Because it's usually overcast or in the clouds. This was, I talked about the S curve. This is Denali, the foothills of Denali. And light, it's all about light, okay? And my good buddy, Ralph Lee Hopkins, has a saying, find the light and shoot what's in it, okay? So light is more important than anything, you know? I mean, if you find good light, you can almost aim the camera at it and it's gonna make a difference. So yeah, I spent three months up there pretty much by myself uh, and had a great time. This is up in the Brooks Range. Uh, Gates of the Arctic. I went up there, I found a group of photographers. I generally don't like to travel with photographers. You know how they are. <laughs> but there was a group going up here to photograph these caribou and I was lucky enough to join them. And when I landed, I saw this hillside and I said, you know, this would be a real cool shot to have a caribou going up this hillside. And I pre-visualized it and I thought about what lens and what f-stop you know, I didn't want the background in focus. And we were there for three or four days, and not one caribou went up that ridge until we were packed up, waiting for our float plane to pick us up. I could actually hear the float plane coming, and when this one guy walked up, and I was like, oh, please don't land yet. Please don't land yet. 
and I got this frame. And I, there was another group that came through and I ran up the hillside and got ahead of them and ran up and waited and slowed down the shutter speed. And I said, you know, I love to shoot with a slow shutter speed. And it's, you know, a lot easier now with digital photography because you can shoot at a slower shutter speed, start at a 15th, pan, whatever it is. I mean, right out on the streets, you know, the yellow cabs look great if you pan going down the street with them, especially at night too. So start with a 15th of a second, look at whatever it is you're shooting, okay, and put it on shutter priority, 15th of a second, pan with it and see how it looks, and then adjust your shutter speed from there. Okay, if you're shooting a hummingbird, you're gonna to wanna to go up to 250th of a second, you're still gonna get movement in the wings. But if you're shooting uh, some animal that's just walking, you might wanna slow it down more and make it more interesting. But you, gotta, you have a high failure rate. So I'll do it, you know, if I'm somewhere, let's say whales are in the area, you know, I'll shoot the whales and how many whales tails do you need, you know, until I'm sick of them. And then I'll go, how can I make this picture better? And then I'll start thinking about it and I'll probably slow down the shutter speed. Uh, I showed you this picture before. I was hiding behind a rock as the caribou were coming through. And one time I was in Washington, D.C. Uh, at Geographic and on every corner down there they've got uh, caribou coffee. You guys have caribou coffee in New York? No, caribou coffee. So I'm sitting here waiting patiently as we all do for our coffee, right? Waiting for my white chocolate mocha. And they had a poster there, and I'm looking at the poster, and I'm going, well, it's a caribou. It's got big sunglasses on. He's got iPod uh, earphones in. I'm looking at it, going, wait, that's my picture. Sure enough, <laughs> same picture. The check was really sweet on this one, I'm going to tell you. <laughs> yeah. So, and I flew all around us is Cape Krugerstein up by uh, the Bering Land Bridge. This is the Bering Land Bridge. Uh, they have sand dunes up there. This is the Kubik, Kubik sand dunes. I went up and uh, the pilot who picked me up from the Bering Land Bridge here, he dropped me off there. I spent the night there. The sun doesn't set, you know, in Alaska in the summer. Uh, this is as dark as it got. And he came and he picked me up the next day and we're flying here. There's a little strip over by the sand dune and you know, I look over at the pilot and he's doing this. <laughs> I elbowed him. I said, hey, you know, you can nap on the way back, but, you know, after you drop me off. <laughs> Couldn't believe it. I guess he felt like I was in control. So I was talking about slow shutter speed. Okay, Sand Hill Cranes is a place called Creamer Park in Fairbanks. And they migrate through there. So I probably, it's probably a 60th of a second. What you want is to have the eye sharp, preferably, okay, and the rest can be moving. But something in the animal should be sharp, preferably the head, the eye, and uh, so I guess I, I shot a lot of pictures here. I got one that I liked. First time I saw the Northern Lights, okay, I was in Fairbanks, and I just said, you know what, I'm going to drive on the Hall Road, which goes all the way up to the uh, North Slope. Uh, it's a dirt road that all the oil trucks use back and forth. Now they have the uh, pipeline through there. And so I'm driving along the road. I said, I'm gonna, not going to stop till I see the northern lights. I'd never seen them before. And I was driving along the road, and I passed this creek. And I made note of this creek because the northern lights are usually running because they're over the North Pole. They run northwest to northeast. You know, they're running up here. And so I made note of this. Creek, I said it would be great, you know, because it would probably reflect the northern lights. So I zeroed out my odometer and I kept driving, and exactly five miles later, the sky lit up. Now I had been driving already for two hours. And so, you know, what do you do? You don't know. Sometimes the northern lights last 10 minutes, sometimes they last all night long. And so I had to make the decision as to whether or not to drive back five miles to this spot or to shoot immediately, which, well, I did. I couldn't help myself. I shot immediately, and I was like, there was nothing there for a foreground. So then I drove back here, and the northern lights lasted about 20 minutes, and so I got this frame. This was down in the Aleutians, so when I was there, 
uh, working on this book, I had made up a calendar of three months, right? Where I wanted to be every day. And I called all the Bush pilots. I said, I'm gonna be with you on July 1st and July 2nd. And then I called them, oh, I, how rude. Please turn your phones off. It's okay for me to do it. Uh, and so when I got to Alaska, I met the writer. I said, here's my calendar. This is where I'm going to be everywhere in Alaska every day. And she looked at it and she laughed. She goes, this is Alaska. You know, <laughs> there is no, there's no schedule here. You know, there's only weather. And, and the Aleutian Islands, which is, you know, divides the Bering Sea and the Pacific Ocean, uh, the Aleutian Islands is what separates them. And where they meet, you have that cold air mass and the warm air mass, and they produce fog there. And she said, well, especially when you go to the Aleutians, you got to build in a week. And that was exactly true. It took me three days to get in and four days to get out. And I shot uh, one day there. And that was from the window. This is part of the Aleutians. Okay, this is Unalaska. There's two towns right next to each other. One's called Dutch Harbor and the other's Unalaska. I love that name. Unalaska, yeah. There's some interesting characters in Alaska. So it's a big fishing uh, fleet there. And there was, I went down to photograph this volcano down there. And there was a bald eagle. And uh, so this eagle is sitting on the rock. Okay, you can tell when animals are about to take off, especially birds. They go like this. They're either going to poop or they're going to fly. Okay, but they, they definitely tell you, get ready for something. And uh, so, you know, in this case, again, I was looking for a shutter speed that would get me blurred, but get me sharp, okay, but not any depth of field. I didn't want to see what was going on behind it. So it was probably a 30th or a 60th of a second because those wings are moving pretty fast. Then I went to a place called the Pribilofs where the puffins are. That was a cool place. So then I've talked about Katmai. So I proposed to do a story on Katmai. And they came back to me and said, we want you to do this other story on Bristol Bay. Okay, so here we zoom in on this area. We get here, okay? And this is Bristol Bay. Now, most of the wild salmon that you eat in the restaurants or at the supermarket come from Bristol Bay. And the salmon, the sockeye salmon, but it, all five species of salmon come back and spawn in, the, in these two rivers, the Quijack and the Nushigak. And they go up here and they go into these uh, lakes and they spawn up here. They go up these rivers and spawn up here. Here's Katmai. This is where the bears are. They're waiting for the salmon to jump up the falls. They're going up to spawn. And the fishermen are out here. There's one line here and one line here. And the, the management in, in Alaska of the fisheries is so good. Every day, they're counting the fish that are coming up river. They have different places where they're counting. And they have to let in a certain amount of fish in order to have a sustainable fishery. So they've counted up. A thousand fish come up today. Then they make an announcement on the radio that the fishery will be open for six hours tomorrow at 6 a.m. And it, a lot of times it's tidal because the salmon come in with the tide. And there are 20-foot tides there. Uh, and so what they found was at the headwaters of two of the tributaries, there's one of them here, of the Quijack, and another one you go up to Koktuli, up in here, right in this area where these two tributaries just about meet, they found the largest deposit of gold and the sixth largest deposit of copper in the world, right here. And they want to strip mine it. And exactly. And so, you know, one of the byproducts of copper mining is sulfuric acid, and the other one is arsenic. And so they would put an earthen dam there, a tailings dam, not unlike the one in Butte, Montana, our largest Superfund site in the country. And, you know, if there's any spillage or any contamination of these two rivers is the end pretty much of the salmon run. 
But there's so much money in the ground there. There's billions in the ground. The sustainable fishery brings in 500 million a year. Okay, so every year the fishermen produce $500 million. But there's, you know, 300 billion in the ground there. So the mining company says, look, don't worry about it. If there's any, you know, loss, we'll cover you guys. Okay, we'll pay you if we destroy your fishery. Uh, but it's not so, yeah, exactly. It's like welfare. And so they, so they said, well, why don't you go up there and do a story on this? And uh, so I went up there with a the writer. Here is Katmai National Park. Here's Lake Clark National Park. Here is Wood Tick Chick State Park, which is the largest park in the country, state park in the country. And here is Togiak National Wildlife Refuge. So this whole area is totally pristine. There's hardly anything in here except for some native villages and, uh, and the fishing, it supports this fishing industry. And so I went up there with the writer and we found out about this mine proposal. It has not gone through yet. And I was there, what, three years ago. So it's, you know, the, the mining company, there have been a lot of people protesting it, especially in Alaska and especially fishermen. And the mining company's attitude is, you know what? We're going to just wait till all of this dies down and then we'll proceed, you know, and so because you protesters can't last forever, but we can. Uh, it was, it's called Pebble Mine and it originally was called Pebble Beach Mine because it looks like this, you know, this is the mining area and it looks a little like Pebble Beach from the air. But then they thought, you know, the PR people were like, well, no one would want to strip mine Pebble Beach, so we got to you know, drop the beach part of it. So I got to go up there for the month of July, which is when the sockeye salmon run. And, you know, I found a pilot who, was, who donated his time. Uh, I paid for the gas and the maintenance on the plane. And we flew all over the area. So this is where the Nushigak comes up. Uh, Bristol Bay is to my left. And they have 20 foot tides there. And I put a, this is one of the toys that, uh, I have, I have a underwater housing, and I have the camera in the housing, and I have a little video scope on the back of the viewfinder and the cable that comes to the shore. So I'm sitting on shore watching the National Geographic special of these salmon coming up the river and uh, just firing away. It was great. And so I shot a lot of pictures and got this one nice one. So what happens is the fish come in, you know, they're, first they're born in the rivers, Okay, they spend a couple of years in the rivers going from this size to this size. Then they go out to sea for two or three years. They come back to the exact same streams they were spawn, they were born in. And they spawn there once and die. As they come from the salt water into the fresh water, their, their bodies turn from silver, which is their natural color at sea, to this red color with these green heads. And the females, this is a female, but the males end up with these big hook jaws. They're really amazing. But closer to the mouth, uh, my first day in Alaska on this assignment, uh, one of the ways that they catch the fish from land is called set netting, where you put a net out directly perpendicular to the uh, shore as the fish come up you know, you anchor it out there. As the fish come up with the tide, they run into the net. And then the tide is moving so fast that you wait till high tide, and then you pull the net up onto the beach with your pickup truck. And this net was full of 18,000 pounds of fish this day. So I don't call it fishing, I call it harvesting. And she picked up this fish and kissed it. And uh, you can see there's the little net scar on it. And they build these little huts back there and they live in them during the summer, during the season. That's that same haul of fish. Isn't that amazing? That was my first day there. It was mind blowing. The other way that they harvest the fish from the boats, from the ships, called drift netting. And what they have to do is they have an imaginary line here, a GPS line, that they're not, it's probably here, that they're not allowed to go over okay, or they get a ticket or a fee or fine or something, and then they put the net out. Once they put the net out, then they have to turn their motors off and they drift with the current. 
because the salmon are coming in with the current and they go into the nets. And so what's happening here, this guy's put his net out, he's just about turned his motor off. Meanwhile, all the other guys want to get in front of him because the guy closest to the line is going to catch the most number of fish. So they're all screaming at each other, you know, because they're all trying to cut each other off and, you know, they call it, you're corking me. And here's the beautiful digital photography, the beauty of digital photography, that you can shoot in the dark. You know, here's the moon is setting and, you know, it's like almost dark out, but I can bump up the ISO with a long lens. I'm on a boat. I'm moving. We're both moving. And so we're going out to fish. So they put the net out, the fish come into it, and then without the motor running, they got a, you know, they got a little hydraulic drum there and they pull the net, the fish up and then they take them out of the nets. And this is what the sockeyes look like. Remember I was talking about the flash, toning the flash down? So you can see I did use the flash but I slowed the shutter speed down so I bring in the ambient light behind it. And the G10 or the G15 would be great for this. Okay, so I'm mixing the ambient light so the net's coming in and hear the fish coming off. And then they come up the river to spawn. You get this sea of red. It's just amazing to watch. And the natives will uh, also put their nets out and, uh, and smoke the fish and eat them all winter long. They wouldn't leave me in the smokehouse alone because they knew that I'd be, you know, not only eating it, but stuffing the smoked salmon down my shirts and bring some home. Oh, I love smoked salmon. Yeah, yeah. And they do it, you know, the real way, these guys. They're in there really smoking. And then, so there, here we are at Katmai, right? At the, uh, the walk where Tom took that picture. Look, right here. I mean, we could all take that picture, right? Not really, but uh, anyways. He already took that shot, so I've got to figure out some other way to take a picture here other than the shot we all know. So I did my bear in the hot tub shot. So what happens is, you know, the salmon are jumping up. These guys are trying to catch the salmon in their mouths as they're going up. But once they don't make it and they fall back down, they bump into this guy. And he puts his paw on them. And then he reaches underneath and he comes up with the salmon in his mouth. It's pretty amazing. Yeah, so that's where, you know, he's got his paws underneath. He's just waiting. This guy caught one of the salmon in his mouth. And so slow shutter speed, I'm panning with his head. Because all I want sharp is that. I want everything else moving. Handheld. And, uh, handheld. I do use the, no, you know what? I probably had the 500 millimeter. So I probably use that Wembley head, you know, that Wembley head you can get at D and H, uh, you know, and that Wembley head is amazing, you know, because you just let go of the camera and it stays in position, you know, but it's like floating. It's so effortless. I love that. And that's the only thing I use it for is that big lens. And these two are fighting in front of the waterfall for the prime spot. And I have to tell you the story of this picture because I love it. Uh, so here, you know, I'm at Brooks Camp, the cabins are there, and the m big males are at the waterfall. And so the females, first of all, you don't want to be there, you know, if you have cubs, because the males will kill the cubs to bring the females into estrus sooner. But there was one female, and she had newborn cubs there, and she was down quite a bit from the falls, and she was smart enough. Bears are incredibly smart. She knew that the males wouldn't come over by the cabins. So she wanted to take a nap. So she came with her cubs over near the cabins and she took a nap. And they have a rule there, you gotta be 50 yards away from the bears. Or maybe it's 100 with the mother and cubs. So, you know, here's the mother. I'm watching her and I've seen where she's gone and laid down. So I'm now positioned myself with my long lens, you know, with my back to a cabin. Okay, so I know I'm cool, I know the mother's cool, everything's good, and I just set up and I wait because I think maybe when the cubs wake up, I can get a shot of them walking or something. Well, a ranger came over and he looked at me and he saw them, and believe me, I was maybe 20 yards away, 
and he started yelling at me at the top of his lungs. What he did was he woke the cubs up, they woke the mother up, the cubs stood on their hind legs, they're like, what's the yelling going on? <laughs> and so I, ch -ch 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 -ch, you know, and then they wandered off and I turned and thanked the ranger for yelling. <laughs> Yes, sir. Yes. Whatever you say, sir. Yeah. You got to learn to work with the National Park people. They're really great. And so on the other side of Katmai, on the Cook Inlet side, uh, you can go. There's an eco camp there where you can go. It's pretty expensive. I went for two days with my son. And this was another two British gentlemen. And you go with a guide for the day and you go out and watch the salmon catching uh, or the bears catching salmon as they come up. They give you a little lunch, you go out there, and I was there with a couple from Chicago. He actually was a commercial photographer. And uh, so they give us a little lunch, and so the other guy opened up his lunch and started to eat his tuna sandwich. And this bear looked at him and his tuna sandwich. I mean, this is, I'm as close as, you know, this bear closer to the back of the room. So the guide says, well, maybe you put the camera, you know, the tuna sandwich away. Uh, and then my son got a little bored because we're just sitting there watching the bears, eating the salmon, you know, he's 12 or 13. So he wants to go back to the eco camp. I'm like, there's no way we're going anywhere. So how do I engage him? So I gave him the 100 to 400. I set it on autofocus and auto exposure. And this way, he can be engaged with the bear. So I took the wide angle lens. I love shooting wide angle. So I'm entertaining myself. I got a nice wide angle landscape shot. And then a couple of bears came by. And I'm shooting wide angle. And this one stood up. And put, I could hear my son going, ch -ch 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 -ch. so I looked over at his picture. That's my son's picture. You know, I said, Colin. We're going to make some money with this. <laughs> he goes, Dad, you can have the credit. I want the money. <laughs> yeah. So then I said, you know what? You're a bear whisperer. You know, you can communicate with the bears. This is great. You're coming with me every time. So we, that kept him engaged for the rest of the day. And then at the end of the day, it was time to go. I said, OK, say goodbye to the bears. Wave to the bears. So he waved to the bears. And the bear waved back. You're kidding. The kid is amazing. No, he shot this picture. You can tell because, look, it's autofocus on the center, right? So he's a little out of focus, but you get the point. So Katmai, uh, it was the uh, site of a Novarupta eruption. This is all ash here. All of this is ash. It's amazing. That's the Valley of 10,000 Smokes. Down at Togiak National Wildlife Refuge, there's also Round Island there, where uh, all these male walruses haul out during the uh, summer and pose. You saw this picture before. You go there and you camp. You get a permit for five days. They got little platforms you can camp there. The walruses are down below the cliffs, so you're not going to disturb them. They're not going to disturb you. And they tell you, you can come for five days, but pack for 30. Because if the weather closes in, you go out by boat, and if the weather comes up, you're this there. So I was very lucky. I had this kind of weather for three days. And that, that's all the time I had to be there. And there's fox there. This guy was on the island. And ptarmigan. This is back in, over in the mine site. So and take you back to the mine area quickly. So not only would they possibly mess up the water here, but they would have to build a major road all the way and put in a, a, uh, a deep water uh, port there. And they'd have to bring power and create power here and bring it all the way back in. I mean, basically, they'd be developing the whole area. And this is that road from that road area from the air, they would have to bring a road over to out in here. They'd have to put a deep water port right in there. There actually, it does exist a road now. This guy hauls these little boats, these fishing boats over, so they don't have to go all the way around the Aleutians down to Dutch Harbor 
and on Alaska they can go this way. And I tell you, it's harrowing to watch these boats go along this road. It's, yeah, and there are landslides there and stuff. This is what it looks like out on the Cook Inlet side. How many of you have heard of Timothy Treadwell? Uh, he was the guy who was eating he, uh, death in the grizzly maze at uh, Werner Herzog. This guy went up to Alaska 13 years in a row, felt like he you know, had a connection with the bears, would stand in the middle of the stream while the salmon were coming up and the bears were all around him. The guy was crazy. He finally got eaten. Uh, flying around Iliamna, showed you this before, looking down. This is at, uh, on Lake Clark. Just an amazing area, Iliamna Volcano. This is right near the mine site. This is a tributary coming down into Lake Clark. I had this great pilot up there I told you about. Uh, we were there on an overcast day. I said, well, we, I think we can go back. No, 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 he says, I see a little hole in the sky. And we flew in through here. The problem I had with him was he played art director too. So. You know, I'd see something over here and I'd be like, oh, this is great. He'd go, oh, look at this over here. Well, he was in control of the plane. <laughs> you know. So I had to go and shoot what he wanted first, and then I got to shoot what I wanted. But it was hard to go wrong. It's just an amazing area. This is Wood Tick Chick from the air. Oh, there's two pictures. Yep. Wood Tick Chick. I mean, look at this. You just hate to see this get destroyed. It's just beautiful. And it's like a sponge up there. I mean, to them to think that they can b build a, a retaining pond for all of the chemical waste and not have it leach into the ground is like ridiculous because it's like a sponge up there. This is right down by where the Nushigak comes into Bristol Bay. This, look at all that water. It's just amazing. This is the Nushigak going up. The wood tick chicks are in the background. Same thing here. This is where the Nushigak is, comes into Bristol Bay. So Bristol Bay is here, and this is the salmon are going up here. We were flying around in here, and we couldn't land, but we saw hundreds of belugas that were also coming to eat the salmon, all these beautiful white whales. And this is the mine site itself. So this is the mega center. This is one of those tributaries coming up here, and the other one comes from the other side over there. And they have these uh, little, uh, they're drilling uh, test wells. So they would have an earthen dam across here. So this is the tributary. And it would be the largest earth, earthen dam in the world. I went up and worked with the Nature Conservancy was up there doing a uh, test. Um, they were electroshocking the fish that were in there because the mine people said there were no, the salmon didn't come up this far to spawn, which is true. But what happens is the fry, after they come out of the eggs, they come up here to eat and grow. And so they electroshocked the fish and then they would measure them and count them uh, and determine how many different kinds of fish there were. So I got a little fish bowl and put some of them in. And then, you know, they revive, they just shock them for a minute or two. So we have coho salmon, we have a sculpin, we have rainbow trout, and then the rainbow trout grow up and support a fly fishing uh, sport industry. This is a big rainbow, underwater shot. And this is, I mentioned Butte Mine. This is another copper mine in Butte, Montana. It's called the Berkeley Mine. This is our largest Superfund site in the country. It's full of sulfuric acid. And look at where the town is. It's like, I'm not sure I would want to live there. This is Bingham Mine outside of Salt Lake. And uh, I shot this because we wanted to show what it would look like. Now, there's no environmental issue with Bingham. There's no water. And it's really well managed. But usually when I'm shooting from the air, I'm at 500 feet, maybe 1,000 feet. And like I said, the 24105. And, you know, they have these trucks that work these mines that are as big as houses, right? They're huge. And I wanted to get a shot that showed the truck to get kind of for scale. Well, 
in order to take in the entire mine, instead of being 500 feet, I ended up having to go to 5,000 feet above ground level, and I had to switch to the 16 millimeter lens. So that is how big this mine site is. And those huge trucks that are the size of houses, well, there's a little tiny one here. So, I mean, it's hard to imagine how big it is. But anyway, so the book is really to help support uh, the organization that has been working really hard to stop the mine. There's a number of them. Uh, if you Google Pebble Mine, you'll find out more. I told you there was an environmental conservation issue to this talk. Um, and you can go to savebristolbay.org. And you don't have to donate money. You don't have to buy the book. But if you go and get, just get educated a little bit about it, you know, even if you put in your voice and let your congressman know about how you feel, it all would help. Uh, the book was supported by Renewable Resource Coalition, which is totally, their focus is to stop the mine. And Trout Unlimited has done amazing things, as well as the Nature Conservancy. So that's all I've got to say about that. And if, thank you. Oh my God, look at this. Right on time, good. For more information, please visit us online, give us a call, or stop by our New York City Superstore. You can also connect with us on the web.